Right, we'll, we'll start now then. I'm afraid we'll probably overrun at the other end because I don't suppose I'll shut up in time. Yeah, Jonathan will come. Yeah, he, he'll finish off everything, everything that Jonathan has to do before he goes. <laughs> we'll start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Lord, we pray for especially for those who aren't here, for Christine with COVID and especially for Linda, Lord. Lord, we pray that you will be with her now and with Tony and that you will help them. Lord, you are a God who hears us. Lord, we pray that we pray in your name. And we ask, Lord, for you to hear, to hear and to, to do your will in their lives and in ours. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. 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 If you'd like to go back to Acts for me for a minute. Um, we're doing one verse for about four, four sessions. So it's verse 42. So then, those who had received his word were baptised, and they were all added to that day about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. We did the apostles' teaching last week. Now it occurred to me that this is the perfect fellowship, our church, because we listen to a sermon, we have communion, which is breaking of bread, uh, we then do some prayers, and then we have tea and biscuits afterwards, which is fellowship. So we are the perfect New Testament church. <laughs> why, are you, why are you laughing? <laughs> You're dreaming. You're dreaming, yeah. Um, but often we take the word fellowship, which is what we're looking at today, and we, we take it down to the chat afterwards over tea, biscuits and coffee. And that's what we bring it down to. Um, now today, interestingly, I'm going to start off with some Aristotle, because you all like your Aristotle. Now normally, I do not like using Greek philosophy to understand the Bible, because I think too many people start with Greek philosophy and try to fit the Bible into that. But in this particular case, I'd done my Bible study, and then I realised that Greek philosophy actually, in some ways, matched. So in this time, I will allow it into the building. <laughs> so Aristotle defines the polis, that means the city, or city, as a koinonia. Now koinonia is the word that's used in Acts here for fellowship. It's a gathering together of people, people of like mind, of like interests, for a... Um, for mutual support. So he describes the polis or the city as a koinonia or political association. All such associations, like all deliberate human acts, are formed with the aim of achieving some good. Political associations is the most sovereign form of associations since it incorporates all other forms of associations <laughs> and aims at the highest good. In other words, he was saying that politics is the highest good. <laughs> <laughs> yep. it, didn't, it didn't go exactly well for them either. Um, this is the bottom quote I've got. Man is by nature a political animal. Only as part of a city can people fully realise their nature. Separate from the city, they are worse than animals. And this was their um, an Aristotle understanding of koinonia, the idea of coming together. And you had the various city-states in, in Greece most of which were either on each other's side or fighting each other and swapped around at regular intervals who they were fighting and who they were trying to beat. So, um, so for instance, Athens didn't exactly get on with Sparta and they spent much time fighting. Or then when the Persians come over, they all join together and... But they were always trying to outdo each other. But this is their idea that the polis was the, 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 the city and it was a koinonia, a political gathering of people. So this was an idea that was around when the gospel was written, but it goes long beyond um, Greek philosophy. Let's go back to the first, the first polis, shall we? Genesis 11. Genesis 11. And you'll start to see there's going to be several themes that keep reappearing in this as we go through. Genesis 11, 1 to 9. And the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Mm -hmm. And it came about as they were journeying in the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, 
is Koinonia, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us make for ourselves a city, a tower, whose top will reach to the heavens. And let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said to the so said, Behold, um, they are one people, and they have the same language. And this is what they begin to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible to them. Come, let us go down and confuse the language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And the Lord scattered them across the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore the name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So there's the first koinonia, the first city. It's a gathering together for the common good, for building up their name, for victory. It's interesting that when does God's koinonia start? After Passover. Oh, Pentecost, sorry, Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost? Babel was reversed. Can I just mention mm-hmm. something I saw on television is the Christian program, of course. Talking about <coughs> we're, we're getting back to that one world language now because IT can change any language mm-hmm. into it where you're receiving Google it. Translate. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> there was in the in the hitchhikers in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, he invents how to, how to get everybody to understand their language and he creates something called the Babel fish, which you put in your ear and it translates every language for you. So it's the Babel. But there's an app called Babel. <coughs> yeah, there's an app called Babel as well, which teaches you foreign languages for that reason. Let's go to Proverbs. Let's, see what, let's get some wisdom from Solomon, shall we? And it's another koinonia. Another gathering together of people. There's no word that that word doesn't seem to have a um, equivalent in the Hebrew, but the the theory is there. The gathering together is there. There is a word. There's the word of cushion. I think they call it cushioning. And the idea is, you're, the people get around, they sit on cushions and they discuss it. And they, that's when you had a meeting and you got together. So judges or rulers or the elders would get together and have a cushioning and sit down and talk. So in some ways, that's similar. I mean, it's not it's not the not the exact word, but this is this is the the same principle, the same gathering together. So um, let's go to um, Proverbs, and it's first chapter 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say to you, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood, let us ambush innocents without cause, let us swallow them alive as Shiloh, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious wealth and, our house, and fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us and we shall have one purse. My son, do not walk with them. Keep your, par- keep your feet from their paths, for their feet run to evil and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread their net in the eyes of the bird, and they lie and wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. So the ways of everybody who gains by violence is to take the life away from the, its possessor. That's a koinonia. That's a gathering together for the common good of the group. Come, let us beat them all up and kill them and nick their wealth. That's how the Greek cities worked. That's how all empires work. Let's go and take over India and take all their stuff. Let's go and take over this lot. China's now the new empire in the world. Let's go and take over um, islands in the, the, the Indian Ocean. Let's go and take over this area. Let's, or every empire going back to the first one has done the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's a koinonia. It's a gathering together. It's mm-hmm. a polis. It's a city. And here's another one in Judges. Let's go to Judges. The first king in Israel. I will say this one. And it's one of the sons of 
um, Gideon, who was known as Jerubbabel as well. Jerubbabel. Jerubbabel. Okay. So um, Gideon had died, and he had seventy sons. <laughs> seventy sons. I know. Seventy sons and probably a few daughters chucked in there as well. Um, starting up verse one, and Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and spoke to them and to the whole clan of his, far, uh, his household of his mother's father, saying, Speak now in the hearing of the leaders of Shechem, which is what is better for you, that the seventy men, all the sons of Jerubbabel, rule over you, or that one man rule over you. Also remember that I am bone of your, uh, of your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke to all the words in the hearing of the, of the leaders of Shechem, and they were inclined to follow Abimelech and said, he is our relative. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver from the house of Baal Bethel, Baal Beth Bethel uh, which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows and they followed him. And he went to his father's house in Ophrah and he killed his brothers, the sons of Jerubbabel, 70 men on a stone. Mm -hmm. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel was left and he hid himself. There's a koinonia. Mm -hmm. Come on, let's get together. They went to a city, the city of Shechem. Come and join us. We, what's it better? What's better for all of us? Is it better for me to rule you than that lot? Of course it's better. Let's all get together and make it. It's a koinonia. It's a gathering. It's another city. Go to Revelations. Revelation 17. I could have chosen loads in, in between, but let's go to the main one, shall we? The one yet to come. Revelation 17. Um, 12 to 18. This is following a vision. Um, we've, we've talked about the, the whole of Babylon, haven't we? The, the vision of the... A woman riding on the, the beast. This is at the end of that session. Starting at verse 12. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings that have not received a kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings um, with the beast for an hour. And they have one purpose. And they give their power and authority to the beast. And these will wage war over the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of the Lords and the King of Kings. And those who are with him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. And he will, he said to me, the waters which you saw the harlot sitting on are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and they will make her desolate and naked and they will eat her flesh and they will burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose, by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beasts until the word of God should be fulfilled. And the woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. We have another koinonia. We have another city. We have another group of people gathering together and pulling their power. And as you can guess, it doesn't necessarily go well for Christians or indeed any believers. Back to Genesis. Back to Genesis. There is a... Genesis 19. person in scripture who... Let's say it's complicated. The Bible describes him as a righteous man. It describes him as righteous Lot. But his decisions he made were dubious. But he was trying to be a righteous person in a very unrighteous place. And two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gates of Sodom. Now the reason he was sitting in the gates is that's where the elders of the community would sit. So the idea was when judgment was needed, people would come to the, the little um, sort of town square just inside the gate and they would get together some elders and they would make judgments and they would do what was right. So Lot was sitting there 
attempting to be a judge in Sodom. I don't know how many others were also sitting there with him. But then he does what um, the, law, what the, the law of hospitality. He, in comes a stranger, you look after that person. Same way Abraham did to the, to the angels beforehand. So he was following the law as he understood it. He was trying to be a judge of the law in a very unrighteous place. He was trying to follow the law's hospitality. Anyway, uh, and when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash their feet that they may rise early and go on their way. They, however, said, no, but we will spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, I bet he did. Uh, so they turned aside and he entered into the house and he prepared a feast. And then they baked unleavened bread for them and they ate. But before they sat down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, and the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and to him, where are the men who are with you tonight? Bring them out that we may have relationships with them. But Lot went out to them and had shut the doorway behind them and said, Please, my brothers, my brothers to the people of Sodom, do not act wickedly. Now, the, the, the rule with hospitality is if someone is your guest, you must risk your life to save them. If they are in danger, you must do whatever you can to save them which sometimes explains what happens next. But behold, I have two daughters who have not had relationships with men. Please let me bring them out to you and you can do whatever you like to them. That only do, shocking. Yeah, but only do nothing to these men in as much as they have come under the shelter of my roof. He was following the law of those days. You do whatever it takes to protect your guests, even if you hand over your own daughters to be raped. That's, not the, um, that's rough. Who was that other the one uh, giving the Benjamites with the, um, the, 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 the sacrificing his. The, the uh, concubine. Oh, right, yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly yeah, the same yeah, thing. Exactly the same thing. The concubine went out. Hmm. He chucked the air. Yeah. So, in this case, it's righteous lot, but he'd put himself into such a situation that he was in trouble. He was trying to have a koinonia with a group of people who you cannot have a koinonia with. You cannot. He wanted to be a judge. He wanted to bring righteousness. You can't. Go to Psalms. Psalm 55. Here's King David. Another complicated, complicated life story. Um... Mm -hmm. So here's King David, whether this is sometime, whether this is during the, um, the time of Saul fighting against him, whether it's the time of um, his son Absalom, and various other rebellions he, he had to face, <coughs> I'm not sure, but so Psalm 55, uh, 12, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then could I bear it. Nor it is one who hates, uh, who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide myself from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, and my familiar friend. We who had sweet fellowship together were walking in the house of God in the throng. You got the word fellowship there? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, sweet fellowship. So here's someone who he, he had fellowship with this person who then betrays them. So whether that could be King Saul, that could be son Absalom. He's trying to have fellowship with somebody who betrays him. Going ahead of time, so let's go to Mark. Let's go to Mark. Mark 13, this is Jesus talking about the future events, the events that will be happening soon. So it's Mark 13, it's verse 12. And brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his children, and the children will raise up against their parents, and how they have them put to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name. 
but the one who endures to the end shall be saved. If you like, the family is the ultimate koinonia. Yet here, brother will give up brother. Parents will give up children. Children will give up parents. So the question is, is koinonia really good? Is koinonia any good? Is it just a group of people who get together for their own self-interest? See, I never knew that. I thought it was a nice... Yeah. We just look at it from one side, but there's there's lots of different types of coin onion. Lots of, it's the gathering together. Chuck Nitzel, of course, now with the Lord, hmm. his whole ministry, it was called Coin House. Yeah. But he saw it that as good Well, I mean, obviously, the Old Testament ones aren't using the same word, yes. but I'm using the same principle, the idea yes. from Greek, yes. Greek philosophy, it's the people coming together. Hmm. And what happens to those people who are not willing to come together yes. in this way? Let's go right back to Genesis. Let's go right back to Genesis. I want to show you what koinonia should be. Genesis 2. Someone want to read this one for me? So it's 2, verse 18 to 24. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper of who is right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the world, from the ground, all the wild animals, and then the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. The man chose a name for each one. He gave names to the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But there was still no help but just right for him. So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man was asleep, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He brought her to the man. Ah, at last, the man exclaimed, this is, bone, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she is taken from man. This explains why man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and then the two are united into one. The one flesh I've got on here, one flesh. Now that's a koinonia. That's a gathering together for mutual support. It's a helper. The old author, I said, a helper, a helper meet for him, or a helper suitable for him. Ish, ish, ish. ish. Yeah. So the, the, in Hebrew, it's ish for the man, and isha, I think, for the for the woman. So we've got the same type of thing with man and woman, which obviously the feminists don't like the fact that it's got man and woman anymore. And Satan is doing his absolute utmost to undermine these first three chapters of Chal- Genesis. Chal- yeah. You see in <coughs> Creation, yeah. everything. <coughs> but this is God's idea of a koinonia. Did you notice Abimelech when he went to Shechem? He said, that I am your bone, I am your flesh. He was echoing back to this. To, yeah. to he was be- echoing back to this. Um, let's see what Paul says. Go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Christian Fellowship. I want to look at what Christian fellowship should be, not what earthly Greek fellowship is about. God yes. is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. With his Son. So a Christian fellowship is not fellowship with our fellow Christians automatically, it is fellowship with Jesus. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Um, I remember going to a marriage thing once and it, it talked about if, if you're married to an unbeliever or you're married to a believer. Two believers who get closer to God, as it were, go up the triangle. What happens? They get closer to each other. If you've got an believer and an unbeliever who are married, as one gets closer to God, they get further away from the other. So our fellowship is actually with Jesus. Our koinonia is with him. And as we get closer to him, we come closer to each other as well. Let's go to Philippians. Now, I, I, I've decided I like the book of Philippians. There's, there's two books we're going to look at, Philippians and Colossians, and a bit of Ephesians thrown in there as well. But Philippians got the idea of fellowship. Colossians did. Uh, the Corinthians didn't. So let's go to Philippians 1. The word koinonia is not actually used many times in the New Testament. 
So where it is used is quite significant, and it's used three times in the book of Philippians. It's used a lot, lot in the first John, and it's used a lot in Philippians. <coughs> so we'll be coming back to Philippians several times, so you might want to put a bookmark in there. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always offering prayers with joy in every prayer for your, in view of your participation. What word you got there for partici participation? The verse five, your, the, the view of yeah, partnership of the gospel. That's the word koinonia. So your word koinonia in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this, that the things that, has begun, that he that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So it's the koinonia of the gospel, the good news. It's the joining together for the purpose of spreading the good news. And we've been called into it, not by man, not by the preacher, but by God. So God is calling us in here. So you put a bookmark in Philippians, we'll be coming back to that. Let's go to Corinthians. Who got it quite wrong. So 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 8. And Paul is basically trying to explain to the Corinthians what, if you like, koinonia is about. What fellowship is about. This is a fellowship they were arguing with each other. This is a fellowship who were one group over here, one group over there. They were all separated out. This is God deliberately put Corinthians in to, say, to show us that because <laughs> most of us are in there somewhere. Right. So he's desperately trying to explain to them. <coughs> now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given to the church of, of Macedonia. That includes Philippi. The one we've just been talking to. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in their wealth of their liberality. I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much entreaties and favour to, to be participants in the support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So the Philippians were under extreme persecution. They were in poverty. They were being attacked. And yet they went out of their way to help Paul. In fact, the Philippians is written from the prison in Rome. Um, Paul was locked up in prison. Uh, and he's writing to, to the Philippians. He's, he's sending it back to one of their guys who had come with him. And the, the Philippians were really worried about Paul. And they, they were feeling guilty that they couldn't do anything for him. And he said, look, don't have to feel guilty. Your man came to me. And he was amazing. And what he did, I count as a gift from you. And I'm sending him back because he's ill. He was ill and I want you to see that he's okay now because you heard that he was ill. So here's a church in poverty under affliction sending to a man in prison. Mm. And here's the Corinthians, lovely rich Corinthians, <laughs> spend all their time arguing with each other. He's, he's, he's trying to explain to them, look, look, this is how they did it. And they did it because I made them do it. They forced it on me. This is, this is what it's about. And what's Paul, what's Paul doing? He's preaching the gospel, the fellowship of the gospel, the koinonia of the gospel. And so the Philippians are joining in with that koinonia. Let's go to um, Ephesians. Ephesians 3, another church that gets it. Someone want to read this one for me, please? So Ephesians 3, uh, 7 to 10. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me, the effectual working of his power, unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, 
is this phrase given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known to the church the manifold wisdom of God. He was given a, a task, a fellowship, a fellowship of the gospel. And you notice it says to bring, to bring light in there as well, verse 9, and to bring light what is ad, uh, the administration, to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery. That's something that's going to come up again. That word light is going to come up again. And yeah, it's funny in this one, it just says to make plain. Hmm. We have a third light. Yeah. I think this, this version, the New American Standard, is very literal. American um, yeah, New American Standard. It makes, sometimes it can be a bit of a difficult to read because they, they, they put things exactly as it is written down as opposed to in a, in a way that we would say in English. Yeah. But yes, it's, it's to bring it to light. So do you recommend that Bible? Um, yes, there's different versions of it, yeah. Because um, I'm always, I've got so many Bibles. <laughs> because I'm always thinking, you know, which one is, you know, close to the... Yes, yes. The, the um, you've got three different options. You can either go for one that sounds the best, you're going for your authorised type thing, that sounds poetic. You can go for one that the meaning of it's there, and made plain, so that's your sort of paraphrases. Or you can go for one that tries to be literal word for word. And obviously it's sort of a triangle and you can move to different places within that. So there's one that's exactly in the middle that's nearly word for word, but tries to make it make sense and tries to make it sound good. And, and it depends where you are in there. So what I've done is I've got three different Bibles. <laughs> I've got more. And okay, so quite often... New American... That New American Standard is yeah. the one that I prefer. But there's, this is a 78 edition... There's a 95 edition, there's a 2000 edition. Um, yeah, 95, I think, is the, the normal one out, but there's a 2000. And there's now one uh, called the Legacy Standard Bible, which is basically this Bible, more or less, but they've used the word um, Yahweh instead of Jehovah or things in, in places like that. Yeah, so, um, so that's uh, one. So. But the, I've got an older, an older version of it. <laughs> uh, let's go back to Philippians. Let's go back to Philippians, chapter 2. Fifteen verses. Um, I'll read this. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship from the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete and be of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing in selfish, empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each man regard himself as more important than, than himself. Do not merely look for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taken on the form of a bond servant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name, and which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Those who are in heaven, and those who are under the earth, and those who are under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved... Just as you have always obeyed in my, uh, not only in my presence only, but also in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work, both in you to will and to work and do his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling and dispute, that you may be proved yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. 
among whom you appear as lights in the world. So at the beginning of that, it's exactly the opposite to the Greek idea of koinonia. Don't do it for your own benefit. Do it for the benefit of others. What's the gospel about? Is the gospel for the benefit of the person who preaches the gospel? Or is it for the gospel of the people it's preached to? So God's koinonia is exactly the opposite to Greek philosophy in many ways. But you notice lights, to be lights. I've got stars. 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 stars, to be stars. Do we need to read the next one, I wonder? I don't hide your light under a bushel. Remember that one? Can you remember what the other part of that verse is, though? Do not hide your light under a bushel, but there's also... A city on a hill cannot be hidden. A city. So now we've got lights and cities coming together. Again, this time in a good context. You've got lights and cities. Let's go to 1 John. Another place where the word koinonia appears three times, I think. I think it's all in this one passage, actually. 1 John 1. 1 John 1. This is one of the mountain tops in the Bible. 1 John 1 to 10. Uh, also, you were commenting that it was with, uh, in, uh, against the opposite to Greek philosophy, and that was also explained why they wanted to debate with Paul. Um, yeah. In the, the new idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so the, the idea, of, I mean, they're the, they got confused, I think, there, because they, they, they thought that the, the resurrection from the dead was a, a god, which yeah. they didn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole idea of Christianity in some ways goes against Greek philosophy. Yeah. There's bits where it matches up because you can't get it completely wrong. <laughs> but the problem is we tend to go by what we know and try to understand the Bible as opposed to understand mm. the Bible and take it backwards. Mm. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John 1. What was from the beginning? What we have heard. What we have seen with our eyes. What we have beheld with our hands handled concerning the word of life and the life was manifest and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim it to you the eternal life which was with the father and was manifest to us what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you that you also may have fellowship koinonia with us and indeed our fellowship is with the father and with the son christ um, Jesus Christ and these things are written so that your, our joy may be made complete and this is the message we have heard and have announced to you God is light and in him there is no darkness at all if we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. If we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out a liar and his word is not in us. Fellowship four times in the same passage. You think he's making a point? Yeah. Fellowship, light. The light the fellowship with the Father. Mm. Let's go to Philippians again. Okay. Back to Philippians, another time for fellowship. And I took out my bookmark, that was foolish. Mm. <coughs> fellowship is costly. It's not for gain, not an earthly gain. Heavenly gain, yes. Earthly gain, no. So Philippians, and it's chapter 3, verse 7 to 12. Yeah. Someone want to read that one for me? Thank you. But for the words to my prophet, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. 
I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Fellowship of his sufferings. Fellowship of his sufferings. Mm -hmm. Lord, can I have the fellowship of power, please? Mm -hmm. The fellowship of joy. Yeah. Can I have the fellowship of tea and biscuits, please? <laughs> yeah, yes, please. We cut out, we cut out that one. <laughs> Let's go back to um, Corinthians. Paul lays it out to the Corinthians. He lays out what this fellowship of suffering is all about. Yeah. So, two, um, two Corinthians again. Chapter 6. Oh, we do all. And working together with him, we also urge you to receive the not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he said, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. On the day of, sal day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Give no cause of offence to any, in, in order that the ministry be not discredited. But in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in affliction, in hardship, in distress, in beatings, in imprisonment, in tumults, in labour, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonour, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers, yet true, unknown and yet well known, in dying, yet behold we live, punished and yet not put to death, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. Our mouths are spoken freely, O Corinthians, our heart is open wide, do not restrain, um, you're not restrained by us, but you are restrained by, uh, on your own aff affiction, affections. Now, in, in a like exchange, I speak as to children, open wide to us. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what part in the ship has righteousness and lawlessness? Or what <coughs> fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Blah means worthlessness, by the way. Or what ha uh, has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk amongst them. And they will be, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out of the midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. And I will be your father. You shall be my sons and daughters to me, said the Lord Almighty. Mm -hmm. So that's not for personal benefit. <laughs> Paul could have had far better ways of having an easy life. But it's for fellowship. And it's coming out of the world. As the Bible says, we are in the world, but we should not be of the world. That doesn't mean you're not friends with people, yes. but you should not, in that way, have a koinonia with them. No, he was saying that in the preach, didn't he? he? I, I didn't hear I was out here. Oh, yeah. I, I miss all the sermons. I recorded it. To not be in the world. Uh, yeah. We're, yeah, we've got to be. Yeah. Yeah. should be a difference. Yeah, we're not of the world. Okay, now the question is, what advantage is there? To any of this, let's go to Solomon, Solomon shall we? Again, to Ecclesiastes. Ah, uh, you know you're in for a cheerful time when you go to Ecclesiastes. One of my favourite books, actually. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Uh, so Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9 to 12. Two are better than one. 
because they have a good return for their labour. For if either of them falls, one, uh, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who falls when there is no one to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can be overpowered by, uh, by him, um, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Mm -hmm. That idea of a cord of three strands. If you just twist one lot of cotton together and pull it, it will snap. But if you twist three lots and wrap them round, it gets stronger. Yeah. So boats on the ships, they, they can have 20, 30 strands all put in there. But here's the idea. By being together, by being in a koinonia, you support each other. Yes. Yeah. It's easy to be on your own. Imagine a, a fire, it's all glowing. You take one coal out and you put it on the side and you leave it. Which one's going to go out first? True. Mm. The one coal on its own. It's true. Back to Corinthians. <laughs> Back to Corinthians. Now, we should have kept a bookmark in there as well. Really. 1 Corinthians this time, chapter 12. But we support each other in fellowship for coming up to when people are having people to pray with you and like that. Yeah, that means you need it. Yeah. I mean, if you consider the character of Elijah, um, greatest prophet in the Bible, and yet he fell. And why did he fail? Because he was on his own. And no one could say to him, look Elijah, Jezebel sent a letter to threaten you. So what? Yeah. She stuck yeah, with no one. He, yeah. he was on his own. He fell because he was on his own. The, one of the things about Elijah is he is, he's a, I think he's an introvert prophet. He's someone who doesn't like being with people. He was always running away from people. So when God wanted to take these um, prophets who were in hiding and bring them out, he replaced Elijah with Elisha, the man who could plough with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. 24 oxen, and he could control 24 oxen in front of him. And he knew the importance of teaching. So that's why Elisha was put in charge of the prophets who come out, and not Elijah. Elijah's got another job, and one day he will come back, and he will come back with assistance this time. And he will not fall. He will die. <laughs> he will die. But that's what, that's, that's what he, his greatest... In Elijah's life, his greatest failure was he ran. And he felt that for the rest of his life. I ran. Even if she had killed me, so what? Yes. And eventually he will come back and he will stand up against the Antichrist. But there will be somebody else with him. Antichrist kills him. So what? Three days later, he yes. rises. So yes. what? And that's Elijah's going to be given a second chance to get it right. Um. But anyway, I digress. Uh, where was I? Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12. <coughs> Someone want to read that for me, please? Uh, 12 to 31. Quite a long one, I'm afraid. <coughs> what is a unit that is made up of many parts? And not all its parts and units come from one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptised by one spirit into one body. For the Jews, Greeks, slave or free, were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, and it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not, I do not belong to the body, it would for, not that, for that reason cease to be part of the body. It would not, sorry, for that reason, it seems to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? And it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need it. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be the weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Mm -hmm. While our presentable parts need no such special treatment. 
But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked him. So there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, and also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, and those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? and do all the interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gift. And now I show you the most excellent way. And we go on to love, which is a whole other subject. Mm. That's a koinonia, isn't it? A body of Christ. You notice it's called it the body of Christ? Yes. So it's not a, a, a city, it's not a fellowship, no. it's not a group, group gathered together or association, it's a body. If you like the ultimate koinonia. Yeah. So my, my hand helps me out, my, my occasionally my head helps me out occasionally. Uh, my foot gets me to where I want to go to, my bum I sit on occasionally, you know. Uh, it's like the, um, the flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone bits. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. We'll, we'll cut over from Ephesians. Let's go to Hebrews. Uh, the Ephesians one you can read again, it says very much the same. There's slightly different. Let's go straight to Hebrews. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated to us through the veil that is his flesh. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, my blood flowing in your veins. So the church is not just a group, it is the body of Christ. In the same way that God took, as it were, the, 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 the rib out of Adam, placed closest to his heart, and made the woman. God has taken Christ and made the church. We are bone of his bone. We are flesh of his flesh. That is what it's supposed to be. It's amazing. Let's keep reading this. It's amazing. Yeah. If we take it literally, I mean, we know those words so well, but if we take it what it actually says, it's stunning. That word they use, um, help meet for um, eat, beginning, uh, when you look it up in the, the dictionary, it, it's only really used in terms of man's relationship with God after that point as well. Mm. So, you know, that relationship between man and woman is very much reflected in yeah. man and God too. It's, yeah. it's really the church is described as the bride of Christ. Yes. yes. It's a woman suitable mm -hmm. for Christ. And, and he's coming back for a bride, isn't mm. he? Oh, we'll get there eventually, don't worry. It's on you as well. <laughs> let's, finish, let's finish this Hebrews one. <laughs> anyway, where was I? Um, verse 20. And, and by a new... And by a new and living way, he was inaugurated to us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great, great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, cleaned from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Forsaking our own assembling, to, uh, sorry, not forsaking our own assembling together, as did the habit of some, but encouraging one another, um, as all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay. So do not forsake your assembling, your koinonia together. Now the day in that question is the second coming. The day or the, the the day of the Lord, I think I've done a session on that. Um, 
And you can imagine, as Jesus said, if brother is betraying brother, as father is betraying children, and if friends are betraying each other, the temptation will be, I'm going to hide somebody, if you don't mind. I'm not going to join in with anybody. I'm going to stay and keep quiet. But here's the Bible saying, as the day draws closer, keep meeting. We look at the church at the moment, the church is crumbling. So the Methodists have now um, gone for LGBTQ as far as I understand. So the C of E is thinking about it in their usual fudge way. There's other places, every, yeah, the back. Yeah. The various different churches are all crumbling. Um, the Church of Scotland, I think, is crumbling as well. But the real point is, yeah. obviously, yeah. it's the fellowship with one another, with the life, but they're not, not a church. Hmm. And do you, you come out mm-hmm. yeah. because the fellowship is unacceptable? Yeah. Because they yeah. accept yeah. the leadership. They're accepting what yeah. isn't written. Mm. <coughs> come out of them, my, ch- my children. Mm-hmm. Let's go to Matthew, to the words of Jesus. Let's go to Matthew. This is the ser- this is um, the Olivet Discourse, as it's known. This is Jesus describing what's going to happen, and what's going to happen within the church, or to the saints, I should say. Um, the saints is everybody. That includes the Old Testament saints, the New Testament, the Tribulation saints. So you can't just say the church is everything. <coughs> Some people claim that the Old Testament saints will all part of the church. Uh, it's not. Um, so Matthew 24, uh, 4 to 14. And Jesus answered and said to him, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumours of wars. Uh, see that you are not frightened of these things, for they must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom in various places. There will be famines and the earthquakes. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. They will deliver you up to tribulation, and they will kill you. And you will be handed, you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. And there will be many false prophets will mislead many, because lawlessness is increasing. Most people's love will grow cold, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world for a witness uh, to all nations, and then the end shall come. The church is due to crumble. The church is due to crumble. But we are still supposed to meet together, even during that crumbling, and not to give up, because otherwise it's like that coal taken out and put on the side. What's like the single man who falls in a pit and can't get up? Let's go back to Philippians. Back to Philippians again. I want to go back to cities. What is the advantage? He who endures to the end will be saved. Philippians 3. 17 to 21. Brethren, Join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have from us. For many walk, whom I often told you about and tell you now, even with weeping, that are enemies of the cross and Christ. Those whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, (coughs) whose glory is their shame, and who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship, remember Greek philosophy, the Greek cities, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform this body from the humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exaltation of the power that he has uh, has even to the subject of all things to himself. Citizenship in heaven. Citizenship was of a city. Go to Revelations. Go to Revelations, the obvious passage. The obvious passage. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no longer any sea. 
And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. The bride, the woman. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is amongst men, and he shall dwell amongst them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be amongst them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eye, and there shall be no longer any death, and there shall be no longer any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write these words. Uh, they are faithful and true and he said to me it is done I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end mm -hmm. I will give to the one who is thirsty from the spring of the water of life without cost mm -hmm. he who overcomes shall inherit these things and I shall be his God and he shall be my son and then on to verse 21 and they were talking about the city now and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each was the pearls a single pearl, and the streets of the city were pure gold, like transparent glass, and there was no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are in its, are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it for, um, for it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. So the light is shining through it. Here's a city made of transparent gold mm -hmm. with the light of God shining through it. Mm -hmm. And the nations shall walk by its light and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And in daytime there shall be no, no, no night there and the gates shall never be closed. And they shall bring the glory and honour of the nations into it and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination or lying shall ever come into it but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And it's on to verse 5. And he showed me a river of water, clean and clear like crystal, coming from the throne of God and from the Lamb. And in the midst of the streets, on either side, there was trees of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nation. And there shall be no longer any curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And the bondservants shall serve him. And he shall, they shall see him face to face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall no longer be any, any, any night, and they shall not have any need of light for the lamp, nor the light for the sun, but the Lord shall illuminate them, and shall reign for ever and ever. We start with Babel. We end with the new Jerusalem, the body, the bride, made perfect for as the bridegroom chosen by God pulled out of this world by the blood of his son mm. this is all a bit highfalutin stuff is it mm. let's go to the book of Ruth last one this I think is I think it's the greatest example of fellowship in the Bible mm. it's unlikely I'm going to get through it without crying Somebody else want to read it? So Ruth chapter 1, 14 to 17. And they lifted up their voices and wept to go in, and all for a kiss her, kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her God. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you, or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. Koinonia? So a peasant girl from Eden. I think it's Edom, isn't it? She uh, 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 from the, yeah. yeah. Who gave herself. She saw something. And that is what Christian fellowship should be like. Yeah. And also she was one of the forebearers of um, Which, yeah. 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 So the um, 
Yeah. Three, two, is it two away from David? Yeah. Yeah. And she was a Gentile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, those words are the... They're beautiful. beautiful that should be the words of the church. Yeah. That should be the words of Jesus. I will go where you go. Mm -hmm. I will follow you where you follow. Mm -hmm. I will die mm -hmm. where you die. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And if we're buried where Jesus is buried, well, we know where that leads. That's the tunnel that comes out the other side. Anyway, coin out here, fellowship, tea and biscuits. <laughs> Let's end with a bow. Father, thank you, Lord, that you have called us. Through the flesh of your Son, through his blood, you have called us to be one with you. Father, help us. When we're weak and we fall short. But Lord, help us and be with us and lift us up. Help us to know what your fellowship truly is. Mm. Even the fellowship of your suffering. And Lord, lead us to your city. To citizenship in your place. Lord, help us in this world to be lights, to be in the world but not of the world, and to show people the way to you. Help us to share in the fellowship of the gospel. Amen. 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 And amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry I've gone on far too long there.